Section 6 of Library of the World's Best Mystery and Detective Stories, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Library of the World's Best Mystery and Detective Stories, Volume 3, by Julian Hawthorne, Editor. Section 6. The Incantation, by Bulwer Lytton. A drowning man, clutching at a straw. Such is Dr. Fenwick, hero of Bulwer Lytton's strange story, when he determines to lend himself to alleged magic in the hope of saving his suffering wife from the physical dangers which have succeeded her mental disease. The proposition has been made to him by Margrave, a wanderer in many countries, who has followed the Fenwicks from England to Australia. Margrave declares that he needs an accomplice to secure an elixir of life, which his own failing strength demands. His mysterious mesmeric or hypnotic influence over Mrs. Fenwick had in former days been marked, and on the basis of this undeniable fact, he's endeavored to show that his own welfare and Mrs. Fenwick's are, in some occult fashion, knit together, and that only by aiding him in some extraordinary experiment can the physician snatch his beloved Lillian from her impending doom. As the first chapter opens, Fenwick is learning his wife's condition from his friend, Dr. Faber. I believe that for at least twelve hours there will be no change in her state. I believe also that if she recover from it, calm and refreshed as from a sleep, the danger of death will have passed away. And for twelve hours my presence would be hurtful? Rather say fatal, if my diagnosis be right. I wrung my friend's hand and we parted. Oh, to lose her now, now that her love and her reason had both returned, each more vivid than before! Futile indeed might be Margrave's boasted secret, but at least in that secret was hope. In recognized science I saw only despair, and at that thought all dread of this mysterious visitor vanished, all anxiety to question more of his attributes or his history. His life itself became to me dear and precious. What if it should fail me in the steps of the process, whatever that was, by which the life of my Lillian might be saved? The shades of evening were now closing in. I remembered that I had left Margrave without even food for many hours. I stole round to the back of the house, filled a basket with elements more generous than those of the former day, extracted fresh drugs from my stores, and thus laden hurried back to the hut. I found Margrave in the room below, seated on his mysterious coffer, leaning his face on his hand. When I entered, he looked up and said, "'You have neglected me. My strength is waning. Give me more of the cordial, for we have work before us to-night, and I need support.' He took for granted my assent to his wild experiment, and he was right. I administered the cordial. I placed food before him, and this time he did not eat with repugnance. I poured out wine, and he drank it sparingly but with ready compliance, saying, In perfect health I looked upon wine as poison. Now it is like a foretaste of the glorious elixir. After he thus recruited himself, he seemed to acquire an energy that startlingly contrasted with his languor the day before. The effort of breathing was scarcely perceptible. The color came back to his cheeks. His bended frame rose elastic and erect. If I understood you rightly, said I, the experiment you ask me to aid can be accomplished in a single night? In a single night. This night. Command me. Why not begin at once? What apparatus or chemical agencies do you need? Ah, said Margrave. Formerly how I was misled. Formerly how my conjectures blundered. I thought when I asked you to give a month to the experiment I wished to make that I should need the subtlest skill of the chemist. I then believed, with Van Helmont, that the principle of life is a gas, and that the secret was but in the mode by which the gas might be rightly administered. But now all that I need is contained in this coffer, save one very simple material, fuel sufficient for a steady fire for six hours. I see even that is at hand, piled up in your outhouse, and now for the substance itself, to that you must guide me. Explain. 
Near this very spot is there not gold, in mines yet undiscovered, and gold of the purest metal? There is. What then? Do you with the alchemists blend in one discovery gold and life? No, but it's only where the chemistry of earth or of man produces gold that the substance from which the great pabulum of life is extracted by ferment can be found. Possibly in the attempts at that transmutation of metals, which I think your own great chemist, Sir Humphrey Davy, allowed might be possible, but held not to be worth the cost of the process, possibly in those attempts some scanty grains of this substance were found by the alchemists in the crucible, with grains of the metal as niggardly yielded by pitiful mimicry of nature's stupendous laboratory, and from such grains enough of the essence might perhaps have been drawn forth to add a few years of existence to some feeble gray beard, granting, what rests on no proofs, that some of the alchemists reached an age rarely given to man. But it's not in the miserly crucible, it's in the matrix of nature herself that we must seek in prolific abundance nature's grand principle, life. As the lodestone is rife with the magnetic virtue, as amber contains the electric, so in this substance, to which we yet want a name, is found the bright life-giving fluid. In the old gold mines of Asia and Europe, the substance exists, but can rarely be met with. The soul, for its nutriment, may there be well-nigh exhausted. It's here where nature herself is all vital with youth, that the nutriment of youth must be sought. Near this spot is gold. Guide me to it. You cannot come with me. The place which I know is auriferous is some miles' distance, the way rugged. You cannot walk to it. It is true I have horses, but do you think I have come this distance and not foreseen and forestalled all that I want for my object? Trouble yourself not with conjectures how I can arrive at the place. I have provided the means to arrive at and leave it. My litter and its bearers are in reach of my call. Give me your arm to the rising ground, fifty yards from your door. I obeyed mechanically, stifling all surprise. I had made my resolve and admitted no thought that could shake it. When we reached the summit of the grassy hillock, which sloped from the road that led to the seaport, Margrave, after pausing to recover breath, lifted up his voice in a key, not loud, but shrill and slow and prolonged, half cry and half chant, like the night hawks. Through the air, so limpid and still, bringing near far objects, far sounds, the voice pierced its way, artfully pausing, till wave after wave of the atmosphere bore and transmitted it on. In a few minutes the call seemed re-echoed so exactly, so cheerily, that for the moment I thought that the note was the mimicry of the shy, mocking lyre-bird, which mimics so merrily all that it hears in its coverts, from the war of the locust to the howl of the wild dog. "'What king!' said the mystical charmer, and as he spoke he carelessly rested his hand on my shoulder, so that I trembled to feel that this dread son of nature, godless and soulless, who had been, and my heart whispered who still could be, my bane and mind darkener, leaned upon me for support, as the spoiled younger born on his brother. "'What king!' said this cynical mocker, with his beautiful boyish face. "'What king in your civilized Europe!' has the sway of a chief of the East. What link is so strong between mortal and mortal as that between lord and slave? I transport yon poor fools from the land of their birth. They preserve here their old habits, obedience and awe. They would wait till they starved in the solitude, wait to hearken and answer my call. And I, who thus rule them, or charm them, I use and despise them. They know that, and yet serve me. Between you and me, my philosopher, there is but one thing worth living for, life for oneself. Is it age, is it youth, that thus shocks all my sense in my solemn completeness of man? Perhaps in great capitals young men of pleasure will answer, It is youth, and we think what he says. Young friends, I do not believe you. 2. Along the grass track I saw now under the moon, just risen, a strange procession never seen before in Australian pastures. 
It moved on, noiselessly but quickly. We descended the hillock and met it on the way, a sable litter, borne by four men, in unfamiliar eastern garments. Two other servitors, more bravely dressed, with yatagans and silver-hilted pistols in their belts, preceded this sombre equipage. Perhaps Margrave divined the disdainful thought that passed through my mind, vaguely and half unconsciously, for he said with a hollow bitter laugh that had replaced the lively peal of his once melodious mirth, "'A little leisure and a little gold, and your raw colonists too will have the tastes of a pasha.' I made no answer. I'd ceased to care who and what was my tempter. To me his whole being was resolved into one problem. Had he a secret by which death could be turned from Lillian? But now, as the litter halted, from the long dark shadow which it cast upon the turf, the figure of a woman emerged and stood before us. The outlines of her shape were lost in the loose folds of a black mantle, and the features of her face were hidden by a black veil except only the dark, bright, solemn eyes. Her stature was lofty, her bearing majestic, whether in movement or repose. Margrave accosted her in some language unknown to me. She replied, in what seemed to me the same tongue. The tones of her voice were sweet, but inexpressibly mournful. The words that they uttered appeared intended to warn, or deprecate, or dissuade, but they called to Margrave's brow a lowering frown, and drew from his lips a burst of unmistakable anger. The woman rejoined, in the same melancholy music of voice, and Margrave then, leaning his arm upon her shoulder as he had leaned it on mine, drew her away from the group into a neighboring copse of the flowering eucalypti, mystic trees, never changing the hues of their pale green leaves, ever shifting the tints of their ash-gray shedding bark. For some moments I gazed on the two human forms, dimly seen by the glinting moonlight through the gaps in the foliage. Then, turning away my eyes, I saw, standing close at my side, a man whom I had not noticed before. His footstep as it stole to me had fallen on the sword without sound. His dress, though oriental, differed from that of his companions, both in shape and color, fitting close to the breast, leaving the arms bare to the elbow and of a uniform ghastly white, as are the cerements of the grave. His visage was even darker than those of the Syrians or Arabs behind him, and his features were those of a bird of prey, the beak of the eagle, but the eye of the vulture. His cheeks were hollow, the arms crossed on his breast were long and fleshless, yet in that skeleton form there was something which conveyed the idea of a serpent's suppleness and strength and as the hungry, watchful eyes met my own startled gaze, I recoiled impulsively with that inward warning of danger which is conveyed to a man as to inferior animals, in the very aspect of the creatures that sting or devour. At my movement the man inclined his head in the submissive eastern salutation, and spoke in his foreign tongue, softly, humbly, fawningly, to judge by his tone and his gesture. I moved yet farther away from him with loathing, and now the human thought flashed upon me. Was I, in truth, exposed to no danger in trusting myself to the mercy of the weird and remorseless master of those hirelings from the east? Seven men in number, two at least of them formidably armed, and docile as bloodhounds to the hunter, who has only to show them their prey. But fear of man, like myself, is not my weakness. Where fear found its way to my heart, it was through the doubts or the fancies in which man like myself disappeared in the attributes, dark and unknown, which we give to a fiend or a spectre. And perhaps, if I could have paused to analyze my own sensations, the very presence of this escort, creatures of flesh and blood, lessened the dread of my incomprehensible tempter. Rather a hundred times front and defy those seven eastern slaves, I, haughty son of the Anglo-Saxon, who conquers all races because he fears no odds, than have seen again on the walls of my threshold the luminous, bodiless shadow. Besides, Lillian, Lillian, for one chance of saving her life, however wild and chimerical that chance might be, I would have shrunk not a foot from the march of an army." 
Thus reassured and thus resolved, I advanced, with a smile of disdain, to meet Margrave and his veiled companion, as they now came from the moonlit copse. Well, I said to him, with an irony that unconsciously mimicked his own, have you taken advice with your nurse? I assume that the dark form by your side is that of Aisha. The woman looked at me from her sable veil with her steadfast, solemn eyes, and said in English, though with a foreign accent, The nurse born in Asia is but wise through her love. The pale son of Europe is wise through his art. The nurse says, Forbear. Do you say adventure? Peace, exclaimed Margrave, stamping his foot on the ground. I take no counsel from either. It is for me to resolve, for you to obey, and for him to aid. Night is come, and we waste it. Move on. The woman made no reply, nor did I. He took my arm and walked back to the hut. The barbaric escort followed. When we reached the door of the building, Margrave said a few words to the woman and to the litter-bearers. They entered the hut with us. Margrave pointed out to the woman his coffer, to the men the fuel stowed in the outhouse. Both were borne away and placed within the litter. Meanwhile I took from the table, on which it was carelessly thrown, the light hatchet that I habitually carried with me in my rambles. "'Do you think that you need that idle weapon?' said Margrave. Do you fear the good faith of my swarthy attendants? Nay, take the hatchet yourself. Its use is to sever the gold from the quartz in which we may find it embedded, or to clear, as this shovel, which will also be needed, from the slight soil above it, the ore that the mine in the mountain flings forth, as the sea casts its waifs on the sand. Give me your hand, fellow laborer, said Margrave joyfully. Ah, there is no faltering terror in this pulse. I was not mistaken in the man. What rest but the place and the hour? I shall live. I shall live. 3. Margrave now entered the litter, and the veiled woman drew the black curtains round him. I walked on as the guide some yards in advance. The air was still, heavy, and parched with the breath of the Australasian Sirocco. We passed through the meadow lands, studded with slumbering flocks. We followed the branch of the creek which was linked to its source in the mountains by many a trickling waterfall. We threaded the gloom of stunted misshapen trees, gnarled with the stringy bark which makes one of the signs of the strata that nourish gold. And at length the moon, now in all her pomp of light, mid-heaven among her subject stars, gleamed through the fissures of the cave on whose floor lay the relics of antediluvian races, and rested in one flood of silvery splendor upon the hollows of the extinct volcano, with tufts of dank herbage and wide spaces of paler sward covering the gold below. Gold, the dumb symbol of organized matter's great mystery, storing in itself, according as mind, the informer of matter, can distinguish its uses, evil and good, bane and blessing. Hitherto the veiled woman had remained in the rear, with the white-robed, skeleton-like image that had crept to my side unawares with its noiseless step. Thus, in each winding turn of the difficult path at which the convoy following behind me came into sight, I had seen, first the two gaily-dressed armed men, next the black, beer-like litter, and last the black-veiled woman and the white-robed skeleton. But now, as I halted on the table-land, Backed by the mountain and fronting the valley, the woman left her companion, passed by the litter and the armed men, and paused by my side at the mouth of the moonlit cavern. There, for a moment, she stood, silent, the procession below mounting upward laboriously and slow. Then she turned to me, and her veil was withdrawn. The face on which I gazed was wondrously beautiful and severely awful. There was neither youth nor age but beauty, mature and majestic, as that of the marble Demeter. "'Do you believe in that which you seek?' she asked in her foreign melodious melancholy accents. "'I have no belief,' was my answer. "'True science has none. True science questions all things, 
takes nothing upon credit. It knows but three states of the mind, denial, conviction, and that vast interval between the two, which is not belief, but suspense of judgment. The woman let fall her veil, moved from me, and seated herself on a crag above that cleft between mountain and creek, to which, when I had first discovered the gold that the land nourished, the rain from the clouds had given the rushing life of the cataract, but which now, in the drought and the hush of the skies, was but a dead pile of stones. The litter now ascended the height, its bearers halted. A lean hand tore the curtains aside, and Margrave descended, leaning this time not on the black-veiled woman, but on the white-robed skeleton. There, as he stood, the moon shone full on his wasted form, on his face, resolute, cheerful, and proud, despite its hollowed outlines and sicklied hues. He raised his head, spoke in the language unknown to me, and the armed men and the litter-bearers grouped round him, bending low, their eyes fixed on the ground. The veiled woman rose slowly and came to his side, motioning away with a mute sign, the ghastly form on which he leaned, and passing round him silently instead her own sustaining arm. Margrave spoke again a few sentences of which I could not even guess the meaning. When he had concluded, the armed men and the litter-bearers came nearer to his feet, knelt down, and kissed his hand. They then rose, and took from the beer-like vehicle the coffer and the fuel. This done, they lifted again the litter, and again, preceded by the armed men, the procession descended down the sloping hillside, down into the valley below. Margrave now whispered for some moments into the ear of the hideous creature who had made way for the veiled woman. The grim skeleton bowed his head submissively and strode noiselessly away through the long grasses. The slender stems, trampled under his stealthy feet, relifting themselves as after a passing wind. And thus he too sank out of sight down into the valley below. On the tableland of the hill remained only we three, Margrave, myself, and the veiled woman. She had reseated herself apart on the grey crag above the dried torrent. He stood at the entrance of the cavern, round the sides of which clustered parasitical plants with flowers of all colors, some among them opening their petals and exhaling their fragrance only in the hours of night, so that, as his form filled up the jaws of the dull arch, obscuring the moonbeam that strove to pierce the shadows that slept within, it stood now, wan and blighted, as I'd seen it first radiant and joyous, literally framed in blooms. 4. So, said Margrave, turning to me, under the soil that spreads around us lies the gold which to you and to me is at this moment of no value, except as a guide to its twin-born, the regenerator of life. You have not yet described to me the nature of the substance which we are to explore, nor the process by which the virtues you impute to it are to be extracted. Let us first find the gold, and instead of describing the life amber, so let me call it, I will point it out to your own eyes. As to the process, your share in it is so simple that you will ask me why I seek aid from a chemist. The life amber, when found, has but to be subjected to heat and fermentation for six hours. It will be placed in a small cauldron which that coffer contains, over the fire which that fuel will feed. To give effect to the process, certain alkalis and other ingredients are required, but these are prepared, and mine is the task to commingle them. From your science as chemist, I need and ask not. In you, I've sought only the aid of a man. If that be so, why indeed seek me at all? Why not confide in those swarthy attendants who doubtless are slaves to your orders? Confide in slaves, when the first task enjoined to them would be to discover and refrain from purloining gold. <laughs> Seven such unscrupulous knaves, or even one such and I, thus defenseless and feeble. Such is not the work that wise masters confide to fierce slaves. But that's the least of the reasons which exclude them from my choice, and fix my choice of assistant on you. 
Do you forget what I told you of the danger which the dervish declared no bribe I could offer could tempt him a second time to brave? I remember now. Those words had passed away from my mind. And because they'd passed away from your mind, I chose you for my comrade. I need a man by whom danger is scorned. But in the process of which you tell me, I see no possible danger, unless the ingredients you mix in your cauldron have poisonous fumes. It is not that. The ingredients I use are not poisons. What other danger, except you dread your own eastern slaves? But if so, why lead them to these solitudes? And if so, why not bid me be armed? The eastern slaves, fulfilling my commands, wait for my summons, where their eyes cannot see what we do. The danger is of a kind in which the boldest son of the east would be more craven, perhaps, than the daintiest Sybarite of Europe, who would shrink from a panther and laugh at a ghost. In the creed of the dervish, and of all who adventure into that realm of nature which is closed to philosophy and open to magic, there are races in the magnitude of space, unseen, as animalcules in the world of a drop. For the tribes of the drop science has its microscope. Of the host of yon azure infinite magic gains sight, and through them gains command over fluid conductors that link all the parts of creation. Of these races, some are wholly indifferent to man, some benign to him, and some deadly hostile. In all the regular and prescribed conditions of mortal being, this magic realm seems as blank and tenantless as yon vacant air. But when a seeker of powers beyond the rude functions by which man plies the clockwork that measures his hours, and stops when its chain reaches the end of its coil, strives to pass over those boundaries at which philosophy says, Knowledge ends, then he is like all other travellers in regions unknown. He must propitiate or brave the tribes that are hostile, must depend for his life on the tribes that are friendly. Though your science discredits the alchemist's dogmas, your learning informs you that all alchemists were not ignorant impostors. Yet those whose discoveries prove them to have been the nearest allies to your practical knowledge ever hint in their mystical works at the reality of that realm which is open to magic, ever hint that some means less familiar than furnace and bellows are essential to him who explores the elixir of life. He who once quaffs that elixir obtains in his very veins the bright fluid by which he transmits the form of his will to agencies dormant in nature, to giants unseen in the space. And here, as he passes the boundary which divides his allotted and normal mortality from the regions and races that magic alone can explore, so here he breaks down the safeguard between himself and the tribes that are hostile. Is it not ever thus between man and man? Let a race, the most gentle and timid and civilized, dwell on one side a river or mountain, and another have home in the region beyond, each, if it pass not the intervening barrier, may with each live in peace. But if ambitious adventurers scale the mountain, or cross the river, with design to subdue and enslave the population they boldly invade, then all the invaded arise in wrath and defiance. The neighbors are changed into foes. And therefore this process, by which a simple though rare material of nature is made to yield to a mortal, the boon of a life which brings, with its glorious resistance to time, desires and faculties to subject to its service beings that dwell in the earth and the air and the deep, has ever been one of the same peril which an invader must brave when he crosses the bounds of his nation. By this key alone you unlock all the cells of the alchemist's lore, by this alone understand how a labor, which a chemist's crudest apprentice could perform, has baffled the giant fathers of all your dwarfed children of science. Nature that stores this priceless boon seems to shrink from conceding it to man. The invisible tribes that abhor him oppose themselves to the gain that might give them a master. The duller of those, who were the life-seekers of old, would have told you how some chance, trivial, unlooked for, foiled their grand hope at the very point of fruition, some doltish mistake, some improvident oversight, a defect in the sulphur, a wild overflow in the quicksilver, or a flaw in the bellows, or a pupil who failed to replenish the fuel by falling asleep by the furnace. 
the invisible foes seldom vouchsafe to make themselves visible where they can frustrate the bungler as they mock at his toils from their ambush but the mightier adventurers equally foiled in despite of their patience and skill would have said not with us rests the fault we neglected no caution we failed from no oversight but out from the cauldron dread faces arose and the spectres or demons dismayed and baffled us such then is the danger which seems so appalling to a son of the east as it seemed to a seer in the dark age of europe but we can deride all its threats you and i for myself i own frankly i take all the safety that the charms and resources of magic bestow you for your safety have the cultured and disciplined reason which reduces all fantasies to nervous impressions and i rely on the courage of one who has questioned unquailing the luminous shadow and wrested from the hands of the magician himself the wand which concentred the wonders of will to this strange and long discourse i listened without interruption and now quietly answered i do not merit the trust you affect in my courage but i'm now on my guard against the cheats of the fancy and the fumes of a vapour can scarcely bewilder the brain in the open air of this mountain land i believe in no races like those which you tell me lie viewless in space as do gases i believe not in magic i ask not its aids and i dread not its terrors for the rest i'm confident of one mournful courage the courage that comes from despair i submit to your guidance whatever it be as a sufferer whom college is doomed to the grave submits to the quack who says take my specific and live my life is not in itself my life lives in another you and i are both brave from despair you would turn death from yourself i would turn death from one i love more than myself both know how little aid we can win from the colleges and both therefore turn to the promises most audaciously cheering dervish or magician alchemist or phantom what care you and i and if they fail us what then they cannot fail us more than the colleges do five the gold has been gained with an easy labor i knew where to seek for it whether under the turf or in the bed of the creek but margrave's eyes hungrily gazing round every spot from which the ore was disburied could not detect the substance of which he alone knew the outward appearance i had begun to believe that even in the description given to him of this material he had been credulously duped and that no such material existed when coming back from the bed of the watercourse i saw a faint yellow gleam amidst the roots of a giant parasite plant the leaves and blossoms of which climbed up the sides of the cave with its antediluvian relics the gleam was the gleam of gold and on removing the loose earth round the roots of the plant we came on no i'll not i dare not describe it the gold digger would cast it aside the naturalist would pause not to heed it and did i describe it and chemistry deign to subject it to analysis could chemistry alone detach or discover its boasted virtues its particles indeed are very minute not seeming readily to crystallize with each other each in itself of uniform shape and size spherical as the egg which contains the germ of life and small as the egg from which the life of an insect may quicken but margrave's keen eye caught sight of the atoms upcast by the light of the moon he exclaimed to me found i shall live and then as he gathered up the grains with tremulous hands he called out to the veiled woman hitherto still seated motionless on the crag at his word she rose and went to the place hard by where the fuel was piled busying herself there i had no leisure to heed her i continued my search in the soft and yielding soil that time and the decay of vegetable life had accumulated over the pre-adamite strata on which the arch of the cave rested its mighty keystone when we had collected of these particles about thrice as much as a man might hold in his hand we seemed to have exhausted their bed we continued still to find gold but no more of the delicate substance to which in our sight gold was as dross enough then said margrave reluctantly desisting 
What we have gained already will suffice for a life thrice as long as legend attributes to Harun. I shall live, I shall live through the centuries. Forget not that I claim my share. Your share, yours, true, your half of my life. It is true. He paused with a low, ironical, malignant laugh, and then added as he rose and turned away, "'But the work is yet to be done.'" 6. While we had thus labored and found, Ayesha had placed the fuel where the moonlight fell fullest on the sward of the tableland, a part of it already piled as for a fire, the rest of it heaped confusedly close at hand and by the pile she had placed the coffer. And there she stood, her arms folded under her mantle, her dark image seeming darker still, as the moonlight whitened all the ground from which the image rose motionless. Margrave opened his coffer. The veiled woman did not aid him. And I watched in silence while he as silently made his weird and wizard-like preparations. 7. On the ground a wide circle was traced by a small rod, tipped apparently with sponge saturated with some combustible, naphtha-like fluid, so that a pale lambent flame followed the course of the rod as Margrave guided it, burning up the herbage over which it played, and leaving a distinct ring, like that which in our lovely native fable talk we call the fairy's ring, but yet more visible because marked in phosphorescent light. On the ring thus formed were placed twelve small lamps, fed with the fluid from the same vessel, and lighted by the same rod. The light emitted by the lamps was more vivid and brilliant than that which circled round the ring. Within the circumference, and immediately round the woodpile, Margrave traced certain geometrical figures, in which, not without a shudder, that I overcame at once by a strong effort of will in murmuring to myself the name of Lillian. I recognized the interlaced triangles which my own hand, in the spell enforced on a sleepwalker, had described on the floor of the wizard pavilion. The figures were traced like the circle, in flame, and at the point of each triangle, four in number, was placed a lamp, brilliant as those on the ring. This task performed, the cauldron, based on an iron tripod, was placed on the wood pile, and then the woman, before, inactive and unheeding, slowly advanced, knelt by the pile and lighted it. The dry wood crackled and the flame burst forth, licking the rims of the cauldron with tongues of fire. Margrave flung into the cauldron the particles we had collected, poured over them first a liquid, colorless as water, from the largest of the vessels drawn from his coffer, and then, more sparingly, drops from small crystal phials, like the files I'd seen in the hand of Philip Derval. Having surmounted my first impulse of awe, I watched these proceedings, curious yet disdainful, as one who watches the mummeries of an enchanter on the stage. If, thought I, these are but artful devices to inebriate and fool my own imagination, my imagination is on its guard, and reason shall not this time sleep at her post. And now, said Margrave, I consign to you the easy task by which you are to merit your share of the elixir. It is my task to feed and replenish the cauldron. It is Aisha's to feed the fire, which must not for a moment relax in its measured and steady heat. Your task is the lightest of all. It is but to renew from this vessel the fluid that burns in the lamps, and on the ring. Observe, the contents of the vessel must be thriftily husbanded. There is enough but not more than enough, to sustain the light in the lamps, on the lines traced round the cauldron, and on the farther ring, for six hours. The compounds dissolved in this fluid are scarce, only obtainable in the East, and even in the East months might have passed before I could have increased my supply. I had no months to waste. Replenish, then, the light only when it begins to flicker or fade. Take heed, above all, that no part of the outer ring— no, not an inch, and no lamp of the twelve that are to its zodiac like stars fade for one moment in darkness. I took the crystal vessel from his hand. The vessel is small, said I, 
and what is yet left of its contents is but scanty. Whether its drops suffice to replenish the lights I cannot guess. I can but obey your instructions. But more important by far than the light to the lamps in the circle, which in Asia or Africa might scare away the wild beasts unknown to this land, more important than light to a lamp, is the strength to your frame, weak magician. What will support you through six weary hours of night watch? Hope, answered Margrave, with a ray of his old dazzling style. Hope. I shall live. I shall live through the centuries. End of section six.